question I would like you to reflect upon is why are we here? I have heard people make, give talks in which they insist that Marx said X, usually something that they like. Uh, and they berate other people for not having noticed it. And I've heard other people speak here and say Marx forgot something, usually something that they like, and that he should be somewhat revised to include that. And we could continue these discussions ad infinitum. They're very interesting. And they're, they're never ending. Uh, but I don't really think that's why people are here. I think what, what, what draws people here and why people want to discuss these things is they want to know what to do now about the bad state of the world. And We try to address that question, which is not an easy question. Um, people noted, a number of people in their papers noted the well-known phenomenon that uh, Marx goes through popularity cycles. Uh, uh, he goes up and he goes down. Uh, there's a an apocryphal statement that you throw Marx out the front door and he comes in by the back window. <laughs> Why do we do that, though? Well, if times are relatively good, if people perceive time, uh, times as relatively good, then they don't really ask questions about Marx because they would like it to go on forever. They see no reason why it won't continue forever. It, it isn't a question. But when times are not so good, when, when people feel that they are suffering, especially if they're suffering in comparison with t earlier times that they remember, then they want to find out how they can get back to that good era. And then, at that point, they suddenly rediscover Marx. Um, and the interesting thing is, uh, you have to ask yourself, what is, which marks are they discovering? Uh, and, and the point is, it's irrelevant what you say. I'm interested in what they say. That is, the people who are concerned with this. How, what do, what's their one sentence, one word definition of Marx and Marxism? Uh, and, uh, well, it, it is, in my view, class struggle. That's what they see Marx, and that's what outrages then the people who are uh, the uh, uh, defenders of the status quo, uh, because that, it frightens them. It frightens them that people are talking in terms of the class struggle, and they want to deny its legitimacy. How do we know what's happening now? Well, I have a, 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 a basic method which I apply in all circumstances. I say, in order to know what, what one ought to do, one first has to figure out what is going on. It's an intellectual task. We have, we have to analyze somehow and come up with an explanation of what is occurring now, in which case we can then make a moral option we can say if, if X is occurring and we want it to move in this direction or we want it to move in that direction. That's a moral decision. And once we make the moral decision, then we have the, the tactical question, what political activity, of what kind of political activity will indeed move the thing in the direction we think it ought to move? Now, what I would like to do, the way I would like to handle this, is to take start with the intellectual task. And I'm going to do this in two parts. First, I'm going to talk about what is true of any, what I call, historical system. Okay? What is true of any of them. And then I want to get to what is true of the particular one in which we live. Okay? First of all, historical system. The very term 
is a contradiction. When we use the term system, we're talking of something that is stable, that has continuous meaning, otherwise it's not systemic. And if we talk of something that's historical, we talk of something that is changing at every millisecond, instantly, constantly. So how can something be stable and, and uh, st stable and at the same time changing immediately and constantly? Well, that's a contradiction, right? That's a contradiction. That's what we mean by a contradiction. And that's the first basic contradiction uh, uh, within which we live. Secondly, all systems, all systems, and when I say all systems, the word historical system applies to the very largest one we know. Uh, there may be a larger one, but the very largest one we know is our universe. And the very smallest one we know, well, we're discovering smaller and smaller ones all the time. They all have lives. They are not eternal, none of them. So they come into existence, that's phase one. And you have to explain that. How come at this point in time, in this place, a, a, a historical system was able to emerge? And then they have what I call their normal life, in quotation marks. That is to say, they operate under certain rules which they have established for themselves, which keep, keep them in relative equilibrium. And then, at a certain point, for a series of reasons which I'll try to explicate, they go into systemic crisis. And when they're in systemic crisis, it's they, they know that the system is coming to an end. So they are born, they live, and they die. All systems, our system, but the universe, uh, that super mini system that you can't begin to imagine. All systems, all systems fluctuate. That's, that's, that's normal. Uh, think, of, think of a human being. He breathes in and out. It's, it's absolutely normal. Uh, they therefore have rhythms, cyclical, what I call cyclical rhythms. Right? But they also have something which I call secular trends. And why do they have both of those? Let me, do you have a picture? Thank you. Take this and, this is time. And this is a percentage, what anything that's a percentage. But a percentage has a maximum, it's 100%. That's an asymptote. Now the way systems operate is they go, they start here, they go up, but they don't come down like that. The reason they don't come down like that is there's too much resistance from people who have had advantage there. So the, the pressure to come down is one thing, and the resistance is another thing, and they end up like that. And then they go like this, and they go like that, and they continue. And then there comes a point where they're very close to the asymptote. And what happens is they can't go any further because they're approaching the asymptote, and you can't be more than 100% of whatever it is you're measuring here. Talk about what we actually do measure. But so somebody estimated that this is sort of the, about the 80% point. But it begins to oscillate enormously. And then, you see, we have a bifurcation. And a bifurcation is a technical term of the natural scientist. It means uh, there are two possible solutions to the same equation. That is theoretically impossible, but exists. In other words, it violates the very basic rule of, of the physical science, of the natural scientist, 
that equation should have only one solution, and it has two possible solutions. Now, that, again, that model that I show you is true of any system. And with the bifurcation, we have uh, 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 an al two ter alternative paths which are quite opposite one from the other. Uh, and eventually, eventually, this can't go on forever. Uh, the system tilts enough in one direction rather than the other so that the thing resolves into the new system, which is where the tilt is, uh, and it, it, it proceeds like previous systems. Now, let's talk about our system. Our system is a capitalist system, and I use the term capitalist in a very holistic sense, right? Everything is part, is, is capitalist. They're not, they're not capitalist X and capitalist Y. We have a capitalist system, right? It is a world system. Well, a world system simply means uh, it's not necessarily a global system. It simply means something larger than any unit within it, right? Uh, the historic usage of most social scientists has been to assume that the, that the state, the, the, the nation state, whatever that is, right, uh, is, is the basic unit of analysis. And it's simply not true. It's, 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 it, every, every producer within the capitalist system is producing for the world market whether he knows it or not, and is affected in his choices and decisions by that from the very beginning. Every, every, every uh, attempt at a, at a, uh, a cultural uh, definition uh, is, 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 is for the entire system. Now, let me start the, the historical story with the French Revolution. The French Revolution was not about establishing a capitalist system in France. France was already, and had been for two or three centuries already, part and parcel of the existing world capitalist system. It didn't, wasn't established in 1789. Nor was it the end of feudalism. Mark Bloch wrote a, a brilliant article a long time ago demonstrating that as late as, I think, 1911, feudal laws govern large parts of the legal system of, of France. So what, what happened that we call it a French Revolution? Well, the French Revolution was, a, uh, was revolutionary, not in France as a nation state, uh, not, not because it established capitalism, not because it ended feudalism, but because it created a geoculture. And by a geoculture, I mean uh, a set of, of, of assumptions about the world system which are widely shared. And what was this geoculture that was established? Well, it was based on two things. One, what the French Revolution demonstrated, right, was that change is a normal phenomenon. Change, of course, had always occurred in the history of the world. But why do we use the word revolution to describe it? Revolution is exactly a circle that returns to where it is. It's no change whatsoever, right? And it was assumed historically. In, in, in our world and in worlds before, that whatever change occurred was cyclical in the sense that it wasn't a real change. And they suddenly discovered, right, that change was real, that it actually occurred, right? And who discovered this first? Well, conservatives. The conservative, who are the conservatives? We have two books written within one year of the French Revolution by Edmund Burke 
And by uh, who's the other one? Sorry. French. What? Joseph de Mestre. I can't hear you. Joseph de Mestre. Yeah, de Mestre. Thank you. Thank you. And, and they said, there is this change. It's a terrible thing, but it's there, and we have to push it back in every possible way. And there was another group who emerged after them who were called liberals and they were engaged in a struggle and they said the, the conservatives are crazy if you push it back uh, uh, hard enough and constantly enough people will rebel so you have to uh, endorse change but control it limit it put it in the hands of experts who can handle it and make sure that the change is small and continuous and controlled and then within that group emerged a group where, who we can call the radicals who, who, who said, yes, we agree with the liberals, except we want to accelerate the change, not slow it down. Okay? Now, we emerged with three ideologies. An ideology is not a set of ideas about the world. It's a program. It's a program of, act of action about the real world. And uh, we emerged with a, 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 a trio of ideologies, which was uh, what we can call right-wing conservatism, left-wing uh, radicalism, and centrist liberalism. So that's the first thing we have to notice. And the second thing we have to notice about the French Revolution uh, uh, I guess I gave you the second thing already. <laughs> okay. Now, the interesting thing occurs in 1848. And 1848 was, by my definition, a world revolution. That is to say, it took place in, it occurred in one form or another in all the parts of the world that were in the capitalist world system at that time. But in a, in a peculiar way. And now let's look at that. The first thing that happened, first thing that happened there was an uprising in France, right? And there was a social revolution. That is to say, momentarily, a group came to power in the state who were radicals. And they attempted to do X, Y, and Z. And they were, oh, they were oppressed. They were overthrown quite quickly at the, s and they were, uh, at the same time, right, uh, there was something which the, um, they are the people who defined the class struggle as a struggle of the proletariat against the bourgeoisie. And at the same time, there was a, a, a series of uprisings which the historians have called the springtime of the nations. In uh, a series of countries, in Hungary, in Poland, in the Italy's, in the Germany's, uh, uh, there were uprisings of people who, who defined the, the class struggle in a different way. They said, we are peoples that have been repressed. We have been either uh, colonized by others or kept from unifying ourselves in, uh, in, 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 in the, our natural boundaries and we are ri rising up against it. So you had two sets of, arise, uh, of rise, uh, rise ups at the same time. And everybody learned a lesson from this. What was the lesson that they learned? Well, the lesson first of all for the radicals was that previously, previously, the small group of radicals had been dominated by groups who thought that they should uh, uh, physically rise up and uh, overthrow the government. And it obviously, uh, they didn't have the power to do that. 
and they failed miserably. And they learned from that that they could not just spontaneously rebel. They had to organize, organize in order to be able to rebel. They had to create structures which would turn out to be bureaucratic structures that would allow them to organize. Uh, and we'll come back to that. And what do the conservatives learn from that? Well, there was a very peculiar thing. If you look at the history of Western Europe in the years from 1815 to 1848, the one place where the radicals seemed to be uh, having success, relative success, was in England. They, uh, they formed unions, they, uh, 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 they uh, had various uh, times when they uh, rose up and they made the government's retreat. They retreated on, uh, on uh, ca ca the Catholic uh, ballot, and they retreated on, uh, uh, they, they, they achieved changes, but they were all very small changes, not very important changes in the long run. Nonetheless, uh, it was very peculiar that they were the only country in which there was no uprising in 1848. It was all quiet in 1848. And the conservatives suddenly realized that maybe the idea of, of, of bashing them over the head uh, uh, and repression didn't work that well. That maybe they ought to have learned from the English experience that they had to have a, uh, 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 a version of, uh, of uh, a policy which made, uh, uh, which took into account the demands uh, of people and made small changes. And this is Louis Napoleon coming to power uh, and eventually becoming uh, a, 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 a reformist. And what did the liberals learn from that? The liberals learned that they could not make as their primary goal a struggle with the conservatives because that allowed space for the radicals. They had to, in fact, set, establish themselves as centrists, as centrists who would always try to, to control and balance everything, the, the, the conservatives on the right and the liberals, on, the radicals on the left. So we, we got a very interesting system. After 1848, and especially after 1851, we had centrist liberalism governing the geoculture, and the two wings were no longer independent but became avatars subordinate to centrist liberalism. So the conservatives, now simply wanted to slow down the rate of change. Uh, the radicals wanted to speed up the rate of change, but neither of them uh, were outside the control of centrist liberalism. Uh, that takes us, the triumph of centrist liberalism takes us to 1873. Now, what happens then? And now I have to bring in uh, I have to bring in the, 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 the two kinds of rhythms that were, uh, there are an infinite number of, of, of cyclical rhythms within any historical system, but there's some that are more important than others, that affect more things than others. And in the case of the capitalist world system, these two get names. The names are unimportant, but they have the names so I might as well use them. One are called Kondratiev cycles, and one are called geopolitical cycles.
let me talk about Kondratiev cycles um, a, a minute. A Kondratiev cycle is a situation in which producers produce for the market some product on which they have a quasi-monopoly. How do they get a quasi-monopoly? Well, they get a quasi-monopoly in the only way you can get a quasi-monopoly. They get it with the help of, a, of an individual state, or sometimes more than one state, but usually one state, who can, and what does this state do? Well, the state does many things. The, 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 the state, uh, penalizes other people who want to come into the market. It, 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 it penalizes other countries who attempt to uh, uh, work outside the market that's controlled. They, 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 they sell at exaggerated prices. Uh, uh, they buy, excuse me, from, they buy at exaggerated prices products of these things. These are all ways in which they make money. They couldn't possibly make money out of a free market. If you had a free market, a hypothetically free market as defined theoretically by neoliberal or any other standard uh, capitalist thinkers, uh, with a free flow of, 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 of labor, a free flow of, a free flow of goods, of capital and of labor, uh, if you have that, uh, then if I produce something uh, which I try to sell at X price, you as the buyer, knowing with perfect knowledge of, of everything, would go from seller to seller to seller until he found the seller who would sell at a penny over the cost or even a penny below the course, right? So a free market is, is the worst thing in which a capitalist can live. He needs a controlled market. He needs a quasi-monopoly. But quasi-monopolies, like all quasi-monopolies, are self-liquidating. They're self-liquidating because, A, if it's so profitable to be there, other people want to get in. And if they can't get in directly, they can steal the secrets or buy the secrets from people who will sell them from the inside. Or they will go to another government and ask them to intervene. Or they will, they will organize within their own country. And they will organize from other people who want to go into that market uh, and begin to put pressure on the state government. So with all that, after about 25, 30 years, uh, all of a sudden, the, the, the price at which the quasi-monopolist can sell his product goes down and down and down. It is no longer significantly profitable. And at that point, what does he do? Well, there are a number of things he does when he levels out. One of the things he does is he goes in for so-called financialization, as though we talk of that today as though that came in 20 years ago or five years ago or, or, or so. Nonsense from the beginning. What is financialization? It, it, it says that the alternative to um, creating new surplus value which we, which we were doing in, in, during the up period and, 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 and getting a, a, a rip-off, basically, of immense wealth, we will now settle for redistributing existing surplus value. In other words, if I'm in country A and I can undercut country B, then I can shift their, pro their already accumulated surplus value to me. It creates no new surplus value, right? But it may make me rich at your expense or you're rich at my expense. For example, one of the most obvious things is unemployment. Well, 
unemployment goes up, obviously, as uh, in this period, but it doesn't go up evenly across the world. And we try to, what I call, export unemployment to each other. So we have policies in which we attempt in country A to export it to country B. The other thing we can do is we can move the locus of production from where it is to some other area with historically, in quotes, lower uh, uh, rates of uh, payment. Well, why should there be historically lower wages? Well, it's very simple. It's really very simple. If I move from here, where there are high wages, to there, uh, at the other end of the world, or any way far from where I am now, <coughs> and I and I say, uh, I, I I establish a unit of production in this other area. I need what do I need? I need people <coughs> to work in it. I need people to to feed the people who work in it, and so forth. So where do I get such people? Well, there are people who are not involved or less involved in the money economy, they tend to live with, in rural areas, and we attract them to the town by offering them wages. It turns out they can be offered wages that are higher than the real income that they are, presently have, while those same wages are lower for the producer than they regularly have to pay. So it's a sort of win-win situation, right? The, the, the worker is getting more, the, the uh, owner is paying less, and it's marvelous. It's marvelous, <laughs> except it can't last. Why can't it last? It can't last because, no, I don't know. it's not only that you move some people into this area to produce, you have to move some people into this area to produce the food that will be feeding this area with the same business of they're getting more pay and less pay here in this area. But again, this can't last because after about 25, 30 years, several things happen. First of all, the people who move from the rural area to this town, urban area, which has uh, got a new factory of some kind, are initially, they, they're confused, they don't know how life operates in these areas, they're relatively helpless, but they learn, and they figure things out, and eventually it occur they learn that they are not getting paid as much as people are getting paid somewhere else, at which point uh, they begin to ask for more. And in order to maintain constant production, because that's very important, you lose the production, you lose the, the profit from it. Uh, in order to ma maintain constant production, concessions are made. So concessions are made, and they stay in, and then they demand more concessions until the concessions become too much, right? At which point, uh, the whole business is not very useful. At which point, what do you do if you're a producer? You move to still another area of places where people can be hired uh, for low pay. Now, there's a third thing you can do way back in the country where you used to be on top of the heap. You can, you can try to retain certain kinds of production which are more difficult to transfer the skills. Um, but we can say to those people, look, if you don't accept a reduction in your pay, we will move you or the activity to the other end of the world. And so they, in fact, accept reductions in their pay. Right? So we're getting a situation in which it is worse and worse and worse, and we start over again. Now, if you think about that, you think about that, 
that all depends on the availability of areas in the world which are, have not been fully or even at all involved in the money economy. Okay. Now let's talk about the quasi-monopoly of geopolitical power. The reason you have countries operating and seeking geopolitical power is again very simple. For one thing, they get advantage out of it. They, while whatever happens in the rest of the world, they get, they, the state, the enterprises, and the residents of the state all get some cut of the money that's flowing in to the uh, geopolitically strong state. And the way it, it, it maintains uh, 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 its uh, quasi-monopoly is that it, it, um, it, it, it controls uh, new, new production and it controls the use of armed forces, right? So this is a this turns out to be a much longer process, uh, uh, well analyzed by Schumpeter, right? But uh, it uh, there have in fact been only three moments in which you had a geopolitical quasi monopoly. Uh, they all, strangely enough, have the name united in them. They're the so-called United Provinces, which is located where we today locate the Netherlands, or the Netherlands plus Belgium, perhaps. Uh, and they, they were the geopolitical quasi-monopolists in the middle of the 17th century. And then there was the United Kingdom uh, of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, uh, they became the quasi-monopolist uh, in the middle of the 19th century, and then there was the United States, which became the quasi-monopolist in the uh, middle of the 20th century. In each case, the quasi-monopoly doesn't last all that long, but while it lasts, it works very, very well. Uh, now. That brings me to the story. Oh, and that, and that of course is also self-liquidating. It's self-liquidating because once again uh, the quasi-monopolist uh, has the quasi-monopoly uh, because he has the uh, Andrade of quasi-monopoly, and he's losing that, and he has the quasi-monopoly uh, because. He did not spend his money, the, the, the country, in the, in the so-called 30 years war between the two contestants for this quasi-monopoly position, which in this realistic case was the United States and Germany, but uh, had a 30 years war, which the United States won completely. But uh, the, the quasi-monopolist uh, the contestant state, there, were, there, there were tend to be at that point in time three loci of power, and what happens is the former quasi monopoly state links up with the new incoming quasi monopoly state and overcomes the challenge from the land-based. And, and it turns out that the trick of the game is that the winner is, is, is sea and air-based, and the loser is land-based. Because again, there's the whole problem of the cost of, uh, of, of, of moving uh, troops and moving uh, goods, etc. So the quasi-monopoly exhausts itself and then we start on a, a whole process of decline of the quasi-monopolists. So, in 1945, at the end of the Second World War, right, uh, the, only, the only serious uh, 
industrial power in the world which had not had its industry destroyed. The only one was the United States, Great Britain, all of Europe, Japan. All of them had their infrastructure destroyed. Right? It was such an overwhelming situation for the United States that the United States was capable in the 1950s of selling its cars produced in the United States, in Germany or Japan, at prices lower than the producers in Germany and Japan could produce for their own markets even though the U.S. had to pay the cost of transport there. That's, that's how much of an advantage they had. That was an enormous advantage, right? And what happens, of course, uh, uh, is, uh, and so they have the quasi, they have the, uh, and then, then the quasi-monopoly of geopolitical power. They, one of the ways in which they had achieved their victory over Germany is that they had not invested their money in, in building armies, but had invested their money in building industrial uh, competence. And so in 1945, when the U.S. was overwhelmingly strong economically, and remember, you, you really have to remember that in 1946 and 47 there was starvation, starvation in Western Europe. That's incredible when we think about it now. But that's how badly off they were, right? Uh, they, the U.S. had invested, during the war, it had to, of course, uh, invest in the military, but still, they were under enormous pressure in 1945 to bring the troops home. And the political pressure was immense, and they bring the troops home, which leaves the Soviet Union as the only significant political military power uh, they are facing. And in order to have a quasi-monopoly of geopolitical power, they had to make a deal with the Soviet Union. And this deal is metaphorically called Yalta. It wasn't what they literally dis discussed at, the, at Yalta. That's not the point. And, but it's a metaphorical concept of Yalta. And what was the deal? The deal had three parts. It's crucial to see that. The first part is they were going to split the world. Two-thirds of the world belonged to the U.S and one-third of the world belonged to the Soviet Union, and the line was where the troops had met, more or less, in Central Europe, the Odenisa line. And they pledged not to do anything to change those borders, and not to use their military strength in any way to make any attempt to change those borders. That's part number one of the deal. Part number two of the deal was each one is their own master uh, economically. The U.S. was not going to give any money for the reconstruction of uh, this Russia in any way whatsoever. And it's very clear. Uh, when you look at the arguments that General Marshall, our Secretary of State, made to Congress about passing uh, the, uh, what do you call it, the, uh, the act which permitted this, the sending of, of money to our allies. One of the arguments he used was it was necessary to stop the Soviet Union. So it was very clear he was not going to give any money there. He, so the U.S. organized, and why did they organize this group? Because what's the point of having the most powerful se se 
production system in the world if you don't have customers. So you have to create customers, and that was why the money went out in the Marshall Plan. Soviet Union created their rough equivalent, which was their, uh, which was uh, a much more, uh, how shall I say, uh, appropriating mechanism, which they imposed upon their third of the world. And the third part of the deal, the third part of the deal is the most important part of the deal. The third part of the deal is to deny that there is a deal, to say that there's a Cold War, to say that we are eternally against the other side, that we will do anything to change the other side, and they don't mean it. Now, how do we know they don't mean it? Because it's very simple. If you look at every so-called crisis in the Soviet sphere in 1953 in East Germany, in 1956 in Poland and Hungary, in 1970, I'm blanking a little which years, and every time, oh, in 68, very important, uh, and every time they uh, sent in, the Soviet Union sent in troops to put down a, a, an uprising, the United States sat on its hands. It denounced it verbally, but did nothing, did absolutely nothing, right? That is true up to 1978, 1989. We'll come to 1989 a little later. Okay? So, uh, if we look at how well this deal worked, the first part of the deal worked perfectly. The second part of the deal began to break down somewhat in the 1970s. Right? The third part of the deal worked perfectly. Uh, so, but from about 1970, the quasi-monopoly of geopolitical power begins to be undone, not by the Soviet Union, not by the Soviet Union, but by whom? Well, first of all, by all those who wanted to, who were dissatisfied with the small part of the world that they were able to control who wanted to change things. And the interesting thing is, we talk of the Soviet Union supporting China, supporting Vietnam, supporting <coughs> Cuba, etc. It's the other way around. It's absolutely the other way around. It's the, 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 the Chinese, right after 45, what we know now that what what, what Stalin asked Mao Zedong to do is to make a deal, come to some kind of compromise with the, uh, with the Kuomintang. And the Chinese said, we're not interested in that. We are marching on Shanghai. And they marched on Shanghai. So they defied the Soviet Union. And then when we come to uh, Vietnam, the Chinese and the Russians are saying, you know, make some deal. And they're saying, no, we won't make a deal. And if you make a deal, we'll denounce you, and so forth. And so they didn't make a deal. And we get uh, the Tet Offensive. Uh, and uh, again, the Tet Offensive isn't all that uh, effective militarily but it's effective politically because it affects the United States. Because the United States is all happy to send troops if they win easy victories, but not if they begin to lose lives. And what we have is, was a draft system in the United States, and middle class kids were being drafted, and so forth and so on. And so there was this whole anti-war atmosphere in the United States, which put enormous pressure uh, on the US. So they begin to 
they, 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 they lose that. And, and Cuba, the same thing happens in Cuba. Uh, you know, in, 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 if you follow the, what we now have, our, 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 our exact records of what people said and did, and the one clever thing, uh, Khrushchev threatened to, uh, uh, to send uh, his, his, his uh, ships in, and the one clever thing that the U.S. did was they said, accept his offer of yesterday. Mm. And they accepted the offer of yesterday, and he had to withdraw, and there was no military activity in Cuba. So, there's another thing that happened in 68. So, I'm sorry. 68 was therefore, you had in the Kondratiev cycle of, of 45 to 68 and up, and up like that, you had the biggest Kondratiev cycle that had occurred in the history of the modern world system. It, it was absolutely immense. If there was any period of time in that period that you could call an industrial revolution, that period was for 1945 to 1960 or 68. Right? It, it, the, the, the previous ones, and, and Schumpeter shows it quite well, were very minor events, bumps, small bumps. Right? That was a, a real one. And the quasi-monopoly of geopolitical power is the same thing. The US expanded to control the entire world much more than the British had, and the British much more than the, uh, <coughs> the, the Dutch had. So we had the biggest expansion of geopolitical power, but there was no place to expand further. They had reached the edge of the world. They had incorporated it all into the modern world system. So in 68, we reach the limits <coughs> of what can be done with the of cycles and the limits of what can be done with uh, geopolitical cycles. Right? And then a third thing happened, and I have to bring that in. When I said the left organized slowly but difficult, that took them a while to even get to the point where they had small organizations. It didn't, they didn't get these small organizations in Western Europe and North America, and what I call the pan-European world, which is Western Europe, North America, Australasia. They didn't even get the small organizations going until the 1970s, right? Uh, uh, and uh, they weren't taken too seriously, right? But they organized uh, 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 and attempted to create a, uh, a stronger position. Now, as of 1945, no one really took seriously the possibility that these weak anti-systemic movements, I call them anti-systemic because they wanted to change the system in specific, significant ways. Right? And no one took seriously the possibility that they could come to power. Yet the curious thing, now you have to think about that, the curious thing is that the anti-systemic movements which existed, which came forward in, in, in a global revolution, that is, it took place in what were then called three worlds, the first world, uh, the second world of the Soviet sphere, and the third world of the, uh, 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 of the rest of the world, right? In all three worlds, right, anti-systemic movements came to power. Now, think about that. They came to power at the time that the quasi-monopoly of Kondratiev cycles was at its peak. The geopolitical power of the United States was at its peak. Right? 
One would have thought this was the most difficult time for them to come to power. But it's exactly the opposite. It was the only time in which they could come to power. Why was it the only time that they could come to power? Because once again, right, the way you handle uprisings is you make concessions. So the US made concessions, and they imposed concessions on their allies, Britain and France. And then the Soviet Union had to make concessions because no one wanted to lose them. So they make concessions here, and they make concessions there, until they make so many concessions that they are running out of any significant power. And then, and then, what happens is the collapse of the uh, domination of the centrist liberals. Because at that point, what happens is that the right-wing conservatives and the left-wing radicals reclaim their autonomy. They don't, doesn't mean that centrist liberalism disappears. It means we return to the pre-1848 situation of three powerful uh, geopolitical loci of power struggling with each other. And that then takes us uh, to what happens after that. Now, why do I say that there is a structural crisis as of circa 1970, as of then, not as of later, not as of 2008, as of circa 1970? And the very the simple reason is right, that you have exhausted the possibility of uh, One of the contradictions of capitalism, one of the interesting contradictions of capitalism, is that the lower, the less you pay for your workers, the, the larger the profit you make. But, if, but it's also true that if you don't pay enough to the workers, they can't buy the product. So you're pushed in opposite directions. You want to give them, you want to redo, re, reduce their income, and you want to increase their income. That's what you mean by a contradiction. Two things, both of which you want to do, have to do, that move, push you in opposite directions. Now, what, what has happened is that we have exhausted the possibility of effective demand within the entire world system. Why? Because in the past, in the past, Whenever there was a crisis, uh, some people were thrown out of jobs, right? They complained about it. And it was, it was always argued that, of course, these people are being thrown out of jobs, but it's creative destruction. New jobs are created. What are the new jobs? Well, basically, they're white-collar jobs as opposed to blue-collar jobs. So we move from, we constantly create more and more, we eliminate more and more blue collar jobs, and create more and more white collar jobs. The assumption had always been that you couldn't do anything about white collar jobs because it required mental activity. Uh, and it required the intrusion of human beings. You couldn't just have machines as you do with blue collar jobs. The trouble is they didn't, they didn't anticipate what has happened, which is robotization. And robotization has already uh, <coughs> eliminated the bottom chunk of white collar jobs, and it's moving up and up and up. And it will eventually reduce the, well, there's a, a wonderful cartoon uh, um, of a, uh, uh, an owner and his chief uh, assistant. And the chief assistant says to the owner, uh, wonderful, we've now uh, managed to eliminate all workers from our plants. And the chief says, we? <laughs> <laughs> 
So, <laughs> the fact is that there is no limit to artificial intelligence that we can see uh, without ending up with one person owning everything, at which point, of course, he owns nothing because there will be what was predicted, the inevitable revolt. But now, notice something. Notice something. When I say there, we're in a structural crisis, people say, oh, that's been predicted how many times? And they always came out of it. Yes, they always did come out of it. There's one difference. The assumption that they always came out of it was the assumption of a permanent opposition from the oppressed 80% of the population, right? But what we add to it is that now we have capitalists opposed to capitalism because they can no longer make a profit out of a capitalist system. So we have a combination for the first time of oppositions from the bottom 80% and from the top 1%. These are abstract figures, of course, and a struggle for both of them to get the 19% on their side. So we have a bifurcation at this point. Sorry. We have a bifurcation at this point. Uh, now, what is the, uh, what happens after 1970? Well, another thing that people no longer remember is that in the, past, in the 1960s, somewhere around 1965, I forget the exact year, the United Nations passed a resolution, uh, I think unanimously, but maybe there were one or two dissenting votes, in which they proclaimed the 1970s the era of development. No prediction was ever so wrong. It was precisely the era of counter-development. Uh, Developmentalism was the ideology that everybody adopted from 1950 to about 1970 in various versions. They had different languages for it, but the idea was you protected the home market, you uh, uh, built a welfare state, uh, you uh, expanded uh, education and uh, education, health, and lifetime income. That was developmentalism. Everybody did it. The, the pan-European world did it. The, the Soviet world did it in a, using different language. And the third world did it using different language. And, and the key to developmentalism was no, uh, no barriers to the movement of the factors of production, no barriers whatsoever, an open world. And what would happen with, with the, uh, after the 70s was exactly the opposite. The first people who took advantage, immediate advantage, of the new situation was the conservatives. You know, when I went to college, which is a while ago. <laughs> when I went to college, uh, what's his name? Uh, the god of uh, in, in Chicago, the uh, Friedman. 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 Sorry. Milton Friedman. 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 Milton Friedman. Milton Friedman. Yes, Milton Friedman. When I went to college, Milton Friedman was a joke. A joke. People, you know, said this is not Milton Friedman, but no one takes him seriously. And overnight, from being a joke, he became the guru. It was a, a total, total switch around. Right? He became a guru. Development was bad. Production for ex ex export was good. Pr production protectionism was bad. Open frontiers was good. 
reduce the size of your bureaucracy, uh, cut the welfare state provisions, uh, and, 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 and above all, uh, there is no alternative, said Mrs. Thatcher, right? Tina, T-I-N-A, there's no alternative. Meaning, if you want a loan, and you all need loans, because you're in a bad situation economically as a result of the downturn of the world economy, as a result of that you need loans. If you want to get a loan, this is the condition. The condition is the Washington Consensus. You have to agree to do all those things. And who enforces that? The only people who give loans. The International Monetary Fund and the United States Treasury. Right? Uh, and to a lesser degree, uh, the German uh, government and so forth. So, uh, everybody gave in. All, everybody, almost everybody, virtually everybody, no. Nobody could hold out against it. Uh, in fact, the interesting thing is, and again, it's a piquant detail, in the uh, Soviet bloc countries, of course, took out loans too from the same source. Uh, and um, in the 1980s, the Romanian government of Ceausescu, world's most terrible government, and so forth, and so on, and so on, you know, you Romanian, Romanian government, by squeezing its own people immensely and incredibly, paid back its loans. And it was cited by the International Monetary Fund as the model country. The model country for the world was, was Ceausescu's Romania. Okay? Well, okay. <laughs> they all give in, including, last but not least, the Soviet Union. Uh, now, the form of the Soviet Union took right, was, uh, you know, to change people in power. So it was perestroika. And after perestroika, uh, what did they call it? Glasnost. Uh, <laughs> Um, now, that was proclaimed everywhere, notably by uh, one particular prophet, that this was the victory of the West. I say quite the contrary. It was the defeat of the West that the Soviet Union collapsed. Because the West lost two things, crucial things. One, up to then, they could count on the Soviet Union as a, uh, a subaltern power carrying out their needs, so that if any country in their relative zone threatened the status quo ante of borders, they would say, stop it, because that violates rule number one, no change in frontiers. And now, the Soviet Union could be defined and the first person to defy it, we'll get to that in a second, is, of course, uh, Iraq. Now, the second thing the, the US, U.S. lost when it, the Soviet Union uh, collapsed is an enemy. You can't have a Cold War without somebody on the other side. They had no one on the other side. They have been looking ever since. They still haven't found, still haven't found the other side. Okay. Now, let's talk about Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, the, 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 uh, 
Saddam Hussein. <laughs> Saddam Hussein was, of course, a terrible man. <laughs> he was not exactly gentle with people in Iraq. And he did all sorts of terrible things. Really ghastly things. Okay. okay. The one thing he did not do is what they had been claiming since the 1920s. They, he did not try to reincorporate Iraq. So now, why did he do it now? Well, first of all, the, the collapse of the Soviet Union permitted him to do it. They weren't putting, they weren't able to put the pressure on him. That's A. B, right? Uh, he had borrowed money, enormous money, from the United States. The United States gave him in order to fight Iran, which the United States thought was important to do for whatever the United States reason. And of course, they lost immense numbers of lives. They, 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 they did not succeed in uh, changing the frontiers in any significant way with Iran. And they sort of had to give up, at which point they owed money. They owed a lot of money to the United States, uh, but not only to German banks and so forth. And they said, we can't pay it. And you lent it to us. And you've got to forgive us. And they weren't forgiven. And he said, well, tell you what, they're also, uh, Kuwait is, is stealing our oil because they've set up a, 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 a pipeline that goes diagonally into our territory and they're draining it. So I have all these reasons uh, to do it and nobody is stopping me, so I go in. At which point the U.S. has to decide what are they going to do. And they hesitate. They hesitate very long. Very long. In, in geopolitical terms it was very long. And Mrs. Thatcher calls up George H. W. Bush and says, "Don't, don't weaken now, George. Don't weaken. You've got to send in troops." So he says, "Okay, but I can't afford it. You can't afford it. No, I can't afford it. I don't have money. So four countries have to pay the bill: Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, Japan. Who's the fourth? Japan." Germany and Saudi Arabia, and they have to pay the bill. Okay, so they pay the bill. But how do you? How can you be a geopolitical quasi-monopolist power if you can't even afford to pay your own troops? And so he reaches the frontier, and then he has to decide: Do I march on? Baghdad. And he's being urged to march on Baghdad by people who want to have war with the, with the Soviet Union. And they're in his cabinet. He's smart. He says, no, I'm going to stop at the frontier. I said I would keep them from expanding into Kuwait. That's all I promised to do. I will, the rest will be done by, you know, UN resolutions and so forth. And he did that. Now, that then brings us to 1989. Because that's very interesting. Again, the same thing happens. We get this absolute horrible man named, what was he named? Or well, whatever he was named, he was a horrible man. <laughs> he was a terrible thing. His own people, anybody else, and so forth. So he said, we have to go in. And the U.S. said, well, we can't go in, but we'll, we'll support the idea that you send in troops. And so other people sent in troops, and they overthrew him. And then, of course, they haven't been able to put the pieces together again. And it's, you know, and once you go... Other anecdotes, as you, you, you know, uh, Colin Powell said, 
Once you go in, you own the country. And it's not so easy to get out. So you've got to make sure you have a way to get out immediately. And then there's the wonderful story, wonderful story, of the cabinet meeting in the United States, where all the, the president and the, what's her name, uh, the, the secretary of state, uh, uh, Madeline. Uh, all right, all right. Yeah. And, she, and George, uh, George, uh, and, and uh, sorry, I'm having these 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 memory blanks. Uh, she turns to Colin Powell and she says to him, "Tell me, Colin, what is the point of having the most powerful country?" army in the world if we can't use it. And the point is, we did have the most powerful country in the world, army in the world. We still do. Nobody could dream of matching the U.S. military power. But we can't use it. Why can't we use it? Because our own people won't let us use it. Because if you use it, you, you undermine yourself still further because you can never achieve as much as you said as the threat. The threat is the real thing. And once you use the threat, you've undermined your threat. So, we have this impossible situation uh, which our current president may get himself into again. He is smart enough to know that you shouldn't go in, shouldn't send in troops, but he wants to strengthen the army and he and there's pressure to use the army uh, from other people who want to use it to strengthen themselves. And what can happen? Well, many things can happen. But now let me talk about who gets advantage out of the post-70 situation. So we start with the, the right, the conservative right. But who are the conservative right? Well, it turns out there are two of them. It's not just one, there are two. There's a business conservative right. They want to make money. That's their object in life. They're capitalists, right? And they want money to flow back to them. And, and so uh, they, uh, uh, they install all these rules, which is there is no alternative. And, and they, they force the flow of money in the Washington consensus and, and so forth. At which point, what have they promised? They have promised that if you, if you take these loans on these conditions, within a few years, your standard of living will go back up and indeed probably improve beyond that. And what happened is that didn't happen. It in fact got worse everywhere. It got worse everywhere and all of a sudden there was a reaction to the business there is no alternative and people said there is an alternative and the alternative is in fact to do quite the opposite right and uh, of, of what you're saying and it, it is to say uh, uh, close down the free flow of capital uh, uh, redistribute income internally uh, to our people uh, and in fact uh, so where did that occur uh, it occurs really in three successive steps very interesting the first is Chappas now Chappas is a very interesting case it's a country which was invaded 500 years ago and has been struggling for 500 years to regain its autonomy. That's well, a very weak country. So, it never did, but it always was struggling and emerged within Chappas something called the Zapatistas. And who were the Zapatistas? Well, They were self-organized, quasi-governmental, quasi-military units um, 
who <coughs> rose up in an official uprising on January 1, 2014, 15, uh, 14. 1994. What? 1994. Yes, yes. I, I, I'm sorry, not 2014. Sorry. <laughs> 1994, exactly. Now, why did they choose January 1, 1994. For two reasons. For two reasons. One, it was the day that the uh, that the uh, that was to come into operation, and they wanted to give a message. It was a double message. A double message. We don't want you to come in to our territory, and, and we are appealing to people everywhere in the world to support us in this, because we are on the side of everybody who is against state control. We are horizontalists. We are friends with all people who reject the powers that be. Right. So they rose up, but of course, rising up, they were going to be suppressed terribly. So after three months, with the intervention of a progressive Catholic bishop of Chappas, uh, they entered into a truce with the government of Mexico, which has sought ever since to violate the truce, but never quite succeeded. <coughs> So it's a, they, it's, it's, a, it's a constant attempt, but, but the point is, the Zapatistas showed that you could rebel. And then came Seattle. Now in Seattle, we were going to found the World Trade Organization, and we we're going to pass a measure which, which we call uh, um, the, um, what was it called? It was called the uh, anti. Uh, it was going to make it Ill illegal for anyone to establish barriers to the flow of of capital. Right? In other words, they were going to uh, force people to sign away their ability to ever stop the flows going to the uh, powerful countries. At which point, there was three groups of people who surrounded the place of, of uh, the meeting place of Seattle. Three groups of people who had never collaborated before. It's important to notice that. First, there was uh, the trade unions meaning the AFL-CIO officially uh, uh, boycotted this meeting. Boycott is the wrong word. Uh, surrounded this meeting. <laughs> uh, and they cooperated with the people they had always fought, who, who were the um, <coughs> the um, The Greens, right? The Greens and the trade unions had a bit of opposition, but the Greens joined them on this. And then the third group were the anarchists, and they de facto joined them. So these three groups, which had never cooperated before, surrounded this thing, and they won. They won because they forced what allowed the people on the inside who were opposed to this deal to fight it and they had to dissolve the meeting, and they have never been able to reconvene in a way that would allow them to pass this legislation. They, they actually, it succeeded immensely. It succeeded to the point that all subsequent meetings of this kind are held in very obscure, difficult to reach places so that they can't be surrounded by uh, but it's, it's, it's irrelevant at this point. The WTO is a dead organization. It has no significance whatsoever today. Then the third one was the World Social Forum. 
Now then, one of the key structures of the, uh, uh, in the in the 70s and 80s of maintaining, uh, I didn't I didn't even tell you about that, of slowing down the whole process of uh, losing geopolitical power. One of the key processes, uh, only one of them, was uh, to have something called the World Economic Forum, where the elites of the world met, her, spoke to each other, and basically planned their common policies. So the World Social Forum decided to meet at the same time as the World Economic Forum in opposition to it and to uh, uh, give the opposite message, which is another world is possible and how is another world possible by in fact rejecting the whole idea of the Washington Consensus. And they turned out to be a remarkable success and have been meeting ever since. Now, so the conservative thrust, number one, didn't work. They, they made their thrust, they made their gains, and then they were pushed back. So then comes in the other form of conservatism, which I call the socio-cultural conservatives. These are the people who are worried about abortion, who are worried about sexuality, who are worried about gay rights, who are worried about I'm trying to remember the name. Uh, he spoke about it before. Um, well, people are from Native Americans, etc., etc., etc. All these people, right, were uh, wrong. They were all repressed first by the various kinds of legislation. Uh, and uh, what happened is they begin to rebel. And they begin to rebel. And all of a sudden, you see this whole situation of the last few years, where with remarkable speed, incredibly, almost breathtaking speed, all these things which were illegitimate have suddenly been legitimated. And there are a few that haven't yet been, but they will be. That's going on fast and furious. Now, in all of this, in all of this, where is the left? Where is the global left? How come it is not suddenly the powerful voice? And here we are, basically, um, in the middle of this. And the answer really is quite simple where the global left is. The global left has still not learned, right? Because it too is split, right? The global right is split between the business left, right and the socio-cultural right. The global left is split yeah, between the what might be called a, a uh, an economic an economics first left and a cultural left. And what they are, they're not yet willing to use the word left, global left. They're not yet willing to use the word socialism or anything like that because they're afraid of alienating their own camp. And what they have to realize is the bottom 80% of the global left, of the economic left, and the bottom 80% of the socio-cultural left are virtually the same bottom left. The overlap is incredible. The minute they realize that, and the minute they work to bring these two groups together and to work together, then they're the 80%, and they can struggle against the 1%, but now they come to the issue of uh, how you get things to tilt. And that ends the story, because what happens is there is a struggle, a political struggle going on. It is going on between what I call the global left and what I call the global right, or 
I call the global left the spirit of Davos, the spirit of, not the detail, not the actual structure, the spirit of Davos and the spirit of Porto Alegre. And what are the two spirits? The spirit of Davos says, we don't need capitalism because we, there's no way we can stop it. Capitalism is coming to an end, but it should be replaced by another system which is equally or even more oppressive, that is equally, uh, that has, has all the worst features of capitalism, that it's uh, exploitative, that it's hierarchical, and that it is polarizing. And the global left says, what we want is a new system that is relatively democratic, and relatively uh, egalitarian. I say relatively because no system ever is or ever will be perfectly, but it's also true that such a system has never in the history of the world existed but theoretically could. So we have these two systems, well, the global left and the global right, or the spirit of Davos versus the spirit of, of uh, Porto Alegre, struggling with each other for dominance. And because they're not two, but actually four, it's extremely confusing. And people are confused. And, and they're not sure what to do. Right? And so, part of the problem is clarifying. And now we get, therefore, to the end of the story. Right? So, the important thing is to tilt the thing in one direction or the other. And we have now isolated, in my view, what is the existing system, situation. The existing situation is we're in the structural crisis of, a, uh, of, a modern, of the modern world system, which is a capitalist system, right? And, and, and that, is the, that determines what is possible. And that, in, that gives us the possibility of making a moral choice. Well, we're either on one side or the other, right? We have to make it. At which point we come to where we want it to be in the whole time. What are the tactics that will work? What tactics will actually work? Well, we don't know for sure. That's one of the things we have to discuss. That's one of the things, presumably, we're discussing right here, but we should be discussing everywhere in the world all the time. Uh, and in trying out things, uh, I don't have time for that. That's another speech um, of, of what we might try out and, 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 and see if they work, and if not, try another thing, and so forth. But we come then to the end of the, the metaphor of the butterfly. You, you know that a man named Lorenz, uh, who was a, an engineer, figured out I guess now, 50 or 60 years ago, he said, if a butterfly flaps its wings at one end of the world, another uh, butterfly at the other end of the world uh, will react to that and will change its direction ever minuscule way, in a minuscule way. And what they discover is that however you change, however small the different initial conditions, they go out and out and out and out until they're immense, right? So, the trick of the game is for everybody to be a little butterfly and to do their small little bit to push the thing in one direction rather than in another direction. Uh, and I have to give you one additional reason why you can do this. When the thing is in its normal state, when a system is in its normal state, no matter how much ch change you bring about by your energy and by your, uh, pa uh, your, your effort, you're pressed back, forced back to equilibrium. <laughs> And the, I always give the example both of the French Revolution and of the Russian Revolution of enormous energy and pushed back over the years to their uh, equilibrium. When you get to a 
a uh, structural crisis. It's exactly the opposite. Instead of a little, a little change making a big change making a little change, a little change makes big change. Okay. So it's I am uh, how shall I say historicizing the old issue. Uh, Something versus free will. What, what's the opposite? Determinism. 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 Yes. We are determinist. We, we are determinist when we are in our normal state of a, of a historical system, and we have free will when when we're in uh, uh, the structural crisis. At which point you can be a little butterfly. And, push in one direction. If enough people push constantly in every 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 moment of every every place of every moment and every degree, you push in that direction uh, and the other people are pushing in the other direction. If you push enough at one point it tilts. And when it tilts it goes in your direction into a new system. So I say to everybody and people then say to me, is that pessimistic or optimistic? And I always say, it's 50-50. We have no way of knowing. We know only that, that capitalism cannot survive. That, that's the only sure thing. But we cannot predict, no one can predict, no one will ever be able to predict what will succeed it. So we don't know, but we may. And so 50-50 is not a little. It's a lot, I think.